June 2016, the University of Edinburgh launched a project to investigate the benefits of singing in a choir on mental health and the stigma associated with it. A choir comprising 54 members was born, Harmony Choir. Choir members varied in their experiences with mental health symptoms and the ratio of people with different mental health backgrounds was a good reflection of that found in the general population. Harmony Choir was a non-auditioning choir and no previous experience was necessary. In only nine rehearsals, choir members learned the musical arrangements which they then performed in August 2016 at the Just Festival, part of the Edinburgh Festival Fringe. As a clinical psychologist and research assistant, I spoke with uh, lots of service users and um, yeah, a lot of them told me that uh, they really enjoyed the music therapy or the singing group that they did. I have been in choirs myself over the last years and always really enjoyed that. I always found it very uplifting and thought it had some positive effects. And not just to me, but what I saw in the choir. It really brings people together to uh, yeah, work on a piece and uh, perform that eventually. Yeah, I just thought, why not mix those two? Um, there is some research that singing is good for mental health in different uh, groups of people, uh, but uh, yeah, there's not that much. Researchers are still trying to figure out what it is exactly that is helpful, how it can be used to improve mental health. And also the people I spoke with as a therapist and researcher, I heard a lot of stories about uh, isolation and withdrawal when people have mental health symptoms that is uh, tricky enough, you know, when they have low mood or anxiety or all other kinds of symptoms that make them fearful or hesitant to go out. Um, and that uh, changes uh, their view or that, yeah, that has influence on their view of themselves and of the world. And I thought, why not see if I could combine different groups of people uh, with different mental health backgrounds together so um, they could benefit from, from doing something together and at the same time change the, the negative stereotypes that are out there. And hopefully um, that could change the, yeah, the ideas that people from the general population without necessarily having mental health problems. Uh, but to change their ideas about what mental health actually is or mental health symptoms are and um, yeah, just meet the people instead of uh, the, the labels of the mental health symptoms. On the other hand, I thought people with mental health symptoms, maybe it could help uh, yeah, by connecting in a choir to uh, make them feel less of an outsider and see that um, yeah, in actuality, you know, they might struggle sometimes um, yeah, with daily life, but it doesn't mean they have to miss out on stuff and we can still all do things together. When we looked at what makes a difference in terms of the negative impact of stigma and negative attitudes, it's not knowledge and understanding. A lot of these campaigns produced very little difference. But it's the relationships and interactions in our communities that can make a real difference for people suffering from mental health difficulties. We know that in terms of negative outcomes, depression and suicide, some of the most negative consequences of mental health difficulties, are very closely related to internalized stigma and negative perception of others. But, and it's um, social support and social integration that seems to buffer against these very negative effects. To tell you a little anecdote, Gidano Benedetti, um, one of the leading psychiatrists involved in the democratic psychiatry movement in Italy, when the asylums were shut down and people were um, reintegrated in their, in their communities, found that social isolation and loneliness were the key elements that made that recovery and reintegration impossible. What he found most important was the ability for people to express their, their intellectual and creative side. And actually what was introduced was lots of um, interactions around art and theatre and, and music. Um, so it seems what really matters is interactions, relationships and community and that's why a 
project and an initiative such as this and the other ones we heard about today are the core of what really can lead to a change in how we perceive mental health and mental ill health and um, to reduce stigma more than anything else and any science around it. Being part of a little community, um, partly just the kind of physical action of um, you know, breathing and making music and being part of that and um, yeah, and partly some sort of mystical, magical, musical thing, I think, that you can't quite put your finger on. people in Scotland will suffer from a mental health issue in their lifetime and last year we dealt with about two and a half thousand people. We also know that music is very good for lifting people's spirits and moods. You know, um, singing is an enabler, sure, but singing in a group um, harmony, you know, you hear harmony and it's uplifting. Um, so absolutely, I think it's incredibly worthwhile. Just the general boost you get from having all that extra energy in, into your lungs and sort of get, getting all that out, it, it does actually really help. It's great. When Lisbeth first approached me about being involved with the choir and uh, setting up this project, I thought, what a fantastic idea to do that. Um, and the, uh, the research to me sounded really interesting. The thing I was most worried about was, is this going to work as a musical project? Is this something that is going to uh, be, be possible to get all these people, some of whom have never maybe sung in public before, certainly not on stage? Um, and say, right, you're now part of a choir, you're going to learn this part and you're going to perform and after a few rehearsals you're going to stand up on a stage and do that. Um, how will they take that? It turns out they took that extremely well um, and uh, everybody who was a part of this project really pulled together um, into that. It was, it's a real challenge um, and we made sure that it was a challenge. It was uh, a conscious decision to form a choir rather than a singing group or a, a music therapy group or something like that. But to actually say, you know, let's create a choir, let's create choral music together. Um, because it is something that you can't do on your own. It's something that involves a community by definition. Um, and so uh, that I think was the most positive part um, for me. And to watch these people who didn't know each other, who, you know, were pretty nervous, I think, on the, the first rehearsal to come together and turn into this amazing choir um, who gave a stunning performance at the end of the project um, was, yeah, it was amazing to watch. I, like all uh, clinical scientists with a mission, googled mental health and singing 
<laughs> and I found uh, three items that stuck in my memory. One is an article in the Daily Telegraph of all places, would you believe, from 2013, which described the survey that Elizabeth alluded to earlier on, where a psychologist, I forget where he was working, was going to present at a conference in New York on a survey he'd done of 189 people, I think, um, who were uh, self-confessed practicing choralists. And they said that, um, in their opinion, choral singing was much better in terms of how it made them feel than singing alone, uh, presumably in the bath or something like that, I don't know, or even team sports. So maybe there is something about coming together and singing that uh, can do, can access uh, a kind of community spirit perhaps uh, that other uh, group activities cannot. There is also a, an interesting little brief piece in Time magazine from 2013, which I'll let you Google yourselves and dig out a bit more. And even unbelievably, I, I thought, there was an NHS Choices website bit on choral singing, which you might also want to seek out, which uh, has, uh, amongst other things, a woman talking about how choral singing had helped her uh, significantly reduce the impact of her driving phobia uh, on her life. So, uh, galvanized by this, I went on to do a, a full uh, evidence-based review, if you like, of one of the larger databases uh, we use in science, which is called PubMed, uh, for those who know these things. And if you type in uh, singing and psychiatry into PubMed, you get a grand total of 57 hits. That means there's 57 articles ever, pretty much, in the history of the world being written about the impact of choral singing, uh, or anything to do with singing uh, and mental health. And actually, if you go back, the literature starts in 1957, there was an article in a Spanish psychotherapeutic magazine about the Freudian psychological significance of a patient starting to sing in uh, a, a therapeutic consultation. So uh, I didn't bother to translate that. I don't really know what it means, and I suspect it's not particularly germane. What is more germane is there's a 2008 review from a, 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 a pretty significantly good uh, psychiatric magazine which was looking at self-help treatments for depression. And singing was one of those ones that came up as not fully justified in terms of clinical trials, uh, but something that looked like it might be beneficial and might actually be uh, what is the holy grail of depression treatment, something that works really dramatically quickly. So almost as soon as one starts singing, perhaps one moods, one's mood begins to improve. And then I was amazed to find there is actually a randomized controlled trial of the effects of choral singing. It was published uh, in the British Journal of Psychiatry last year, uh, and it was involved, I think, from memory, 290 odds older adults aged over 60 in Kent. Uh, whether this uh, generalizes to the rest of the population, we will just have to wait and see. But um, those people participated in uh, choral singing activities, and over a three month period, it improved their quality of life and reduced their levels of anxiety and depression. So, clinical scientists like myself and Matthias are very interested in in establishing the evidence base for this kind of activity, um, but also in trying to work out how it might help if it helps. Um, and of course, uh, there's all sorts of clues. So there are suggestions that there might be psychological benefits from getting together, getting out and about, um, doing anything in a group, but also specifically, uh, more specifically from this kind of activity, it may release endorphins in the brain, which is the, the body's own natural opiates, if you like. Uh, it may increase the release of the love drug oxytocin hormone uh, and it may increase blood flow to parts of your brain and there's even a brain imaging study showing that choral singing or singing more generally I should be more accurate to say uh, increases the size of different bits of your brain although that was done in opera singers so again you might have to uh, we might have to do our own study about that <laughs> so um, I'm sure what I'm Going to say, what I've said about the evidence is not going to stop people from singing if they're singing and enjoying it, but perhaps uh, they can sing with even more, even more gusto and uh, perhaps the knowledge that uh, there is an evidence base and we might have some inkling about how it might work uh, might encourage others to take part in the future.
We also run a number of national programmes, including See Me, which is Scotland's anti-stigma and discrimination programme. In terms of anti-stigma and discrimination, there is, um, it is, it feels like society's last taboo. It is the one area where we still have huge uh, improvements to make to make sure that people with mental health problems are treated equally and fairly and with dignity and respect. So we know through our work via See Me and our own work at SAMH that nearly half of the people that we surveyed recently, they told us that they uh, wouldn't like to tell somebody that they had a mental health problem for fear of stigma and discrimination. We know that 9 out of 10 people that we spoke to who have a mental health problem told us that they had experienced stigma and discrimination and that might be in the workplace, at home, with family and friends, when they're going to see a health professional. There are lots of things that people can do to take action on this and we actively encourage conversations and to be open about mental health and mental health problems. Um, and it really feels like um, the public are, are warming to this more and more. So we know we've got a very long way to go to tackle this issue and to make um, people who live with an experience of a mental health problem um, be able to speak openly about that. It really feels like it's the last thing we need to do as a society. I immediately, I immediately thought of my favourite mental health quotation from John Milton's Paradise Lost. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. The speaker is Lucifer, who has just plummeted from paradise down into hell. Now, especially in an ecclesiastical setting such as this, taking advice from Satan might seem suspect. <laughs> In this case, however, I think he makes a great point. No matter how good your situation might appear on the outside, if you have mental health symptoms, as so many of us do, your mind has the power to transform something apparently good into something you experience as bad, to make, in other words, a hell of heaven. When I have felt depressed, however, I have found it comforting to remember that the reverse is also true. My own brain, no matter how unhappy or unwilling it felt, nevertheless had within it the power to make things better. Now, I'm certainly not suggesting you can haul yourself out of the mire of mental ill health simply with the power of positive thinking. In my own case, after being diagnosed with depression, there is no way I could have begun recovery without drawing heavily on the help of my friends, family and doctor. And if you are feeling unwell, I cannot urge you strongly enough to do the same. There is something deeply empowering, however, about discovering a small wellspring of resilience within yourself in what might have seemed an unpromising wasteland. Joining a choir has proved just such a wellspring of resilience for me. I cannot explain exactly what the particular mood-lifting magic of the choir is, and others tonight will be able to describe it more eloquently than I. So I will finish simply by saying that the act of sociable singing has helped to take my depression and make it, if not quite heavenly, certainly a hell of a lot less hellish. <laughs> For me as a singing teacher, um, a lot of my students come to me not just to learn to sing better, but to have a time of meditation, a time to relax and use this internal instrument. Um, I have some business people who come to me, for example, um, literally just to have some time to themselves. and. The release and the freedom that comes when you're singing means that they can take that into the rest of their day. In terms of mental health, it's, it's a phenomenal tool. So on an anatomical level, being joyful, joyful feelings open up the voice. You have your true vocal folds which vibrate together to create your sound. 
And you also have your false vocal folds, which sit around the true vocal folds. They can come in and close the airspace above the true vocal folds, which means that you're unable to create sound. When I'm teaching my students, I'll often get them to sit and giggle silently. Because uh, this, on an anatomical level, literally opens up the voice. So feelings of anxiousness, uh, feelings of um, uh, nerves, nerves can, can bring those false folds in and can stop the voice from being able to work. So I think that for me, the idea that joy, joyful feelings open up the voice, that speaks for itself in terms of does using your voice, does singing help mental health? Absolutely. So I have many different students that um, come to see me for singing lessons. Um, and there are two ways we can approach a song. We could approach it technically, do our scales and, uh, and think about exactly what's happening you know, uh, with the voice. But I think a lot of my students come to me and what they're wanting to do is to have the space to express themselves. And what better way than through song? A lot of students will come to me with songs that mean something to them, um, could be connected to people from their past, these songs are important to them and, uh, and the songs could be angry ones, they could be terribly sad ones, they could be joyful ones, whatever it is, allowing the student space to connect to the song on an emotional level, on an intellectual level and to have the space to sing that out, I think it's important on many levels. You know, as actors we need to connect, of course, but as human beings, as human beings we need to be able to connect to these different emotions that are surging away inside of us and allow them to come out. Um, I think when we block and when we hold things in and we don't allow ourselves to express things, you know, that's not going to be good for mental health. But sometimes I have students that want to come to me and shout it out and I'm quite happy to let people do that. I think that, you know, it's it's part of my job. So I also perform. Um, I'm a singer and an actor. And uh, recently I've been doing cabarets uh, in Edinburgh actually. And I find that what I love most about these evenings is the reaction that I get from people during the show and afterwards. That people are coming in harassed and they've had a hard day and a long day. and. Uh, and they get a chance through song to release, you know, whether it's, I've had some ladies come up to me weeping, going, oh, I love that song so much, and I, I feel embarrassed that I'm crying, I feel embarrassed, and, but it was just so beautiful and it moved me, and that for me is just beautiful, that I can sing and raise the energy and the level in a room, I can raise people's spirits, um, and that happens whether I'm singing a sad song or a happy song, you know? Um, so it's not just about singing yourself. I think music, it's just, it's, it's wonderful. It's good for the soul. It was good fun. And I think it was actually a privilege to, to be part of something so um, uh, exciting. And I have met um, a number of people with whom I felt very comfortable and at ease and we all enjoyed working together and singing together and learning songs. When people asked me um, what I was doing, um, it was quite a good thing to say actually. Oh, I'm going to choir practice. And I said, oh, what's this? I said, oh, well, it's a choir and I tried to explain what the project was. Um, and, and it did feel good. Um, I remember somebody asking me, so there are people with mental health problems and people without mental health problems. Uh, and I said, can you tell who's who? I said, no, how could you? And hopefully our performances uh, will help others uh, feel more at ease with their experiences and, and come forward and seek help. Uh, and connect with others. We know that as human beings it's natural for us to divide people in groups, but our stereotypes can be very harmful. 
One of the best ways to overcome this is contact, as Matthias said, building positive relationships with people they are prejudiced against, acknowledge that we can share similar interests, and we are all unique, vulnerable human beings. This will help to create a positive and inclusive society. For me, befriending means spending some enjoyable time with a very nice person that went through some hard experiences in our life. It has been a challenge any preconception of what having schizophrenia looks like and understand how tough and resilient someone labeled as a schizophrenic can be. It allows me to support someone great that would tend to be left out from our community. So befriending is worth it for all of us to, be, to build a really open-minded and diverse society. If you can spare two hours a week, do befriend. <laughs>
was persistent and that it increased from rehearsal to rehearsal and that people took that away with them at the end of the night and kept it all week. Imagine you're on your way out to meet some friends. You're dressed up in your finest and made the final touches to your outfit. Everything you need is in your pockets or your bag. Then you open the front door and just a few feet in front of you there is a seven foot high brick wall. It's solid and there's no way around it and your only choice is to climb it. But you weren't expecting this wall. It wasn't there yesterday, so you have no tools, no rope, and nobody to lend you a hand. It will exhaust you, it will frustrate you. Sometimes it will win and you'll just want to go back inside. But it must be climbed if you have a life outside. What if we call this wall anxiety? Eventually, all small efforts can provide the tools to overcome anxiety. Some people may lend a hand to pull you up. Unfortunately, not everyone believes the wall is there. They won't come and see it for themselves. However, others have seen it and have their own wall to climb. Just over two years ago, I was diagnosed with anxiety and PTSD. It seemed like a sick joke having already had depression for about 14 years. Um, getting help was such a chore and so many long waiting lists and sporadic doctor visits. And all that time, I was having several panic attacks a week, followed by long periods of being too exhausted to leave my bed. I lived under a blanket. I couldn't speak to people, I couldn't work, some days even the television was too much stimulation for my tender brain. The doctors increased my medication, I found myself a lovely counsellor. The rest of my recovery was meant to be routine diet and exercise. Well that's all very boring, isn't it? <laughs> if exercise breaks the cycle of self-loathing, then creativity can free the trappings of the mind. It can release the thoughts and help rediscover the person lost within. I had been lost and I had forgotten to feed that flame within. So I pursued the creative activities, overcoming incredible fear by confronting it. I sought to nurture my curiosity through art therapy, sewing, gardening at Red Hall, and taking dance classes. I got better little by little. The one thing I wanted to do but hadn't was learn to sing. I was too scared to sing in front of anybody I knew, so I searched for a choir. Um, by sheer coincidence, my therapy gun got a notice about harmony choir. Perfect. Um, not only do I get to sing, but also contribute towards research for supporting mental health uh, recovery. <sighs> Breathing exercises are integral to controlling the panic I feel. So imagine taking in that calming breath and breathing out and hearing a sound and hearing it soar and hearing it fill the room and taking up all the space you were once so afraid to occupy to sing out when you're afraid to speak out. Best of all, you can hear the difference each week, hear the confidence growing in each song. So don't ever stop, feed your inner flame, push that boulder up the hill or any other silly metaphor that keeps you going. If you feel you've already done it, how about helping someone do the same? Because sometimes, just sometimes, we all need to help climbing over brick walls. Thank you. singing in the choir and one thing that I took away from it um, was the fact that in the choir you know it was supposed to be for people with mental health symptoms and people without and we didn't know who in the choir was who and really it didn't matter it wasn't it wasn't a big part of um, our interaction in the choir it was more about us learning the music together learning the words and making a beautiful sound and you got to know the people sitting around you based on who they were um, we didn't judge them on their singing ability either, um, but we, it was more about just making friends with people and, um, and enjoying that together. I hope that that could be um, a model for reducing mental health stigma, just the fact that if, if we integrate together and everybody um, is just a, a normal member of a group, then why should you have separate things for people with mental health symptoms and without? I think if we all do it together, then um, we it hopefully will reduce stigma and, and help people to understand each other better. I really enjoyed um, seeing in the concert as well with such a variety of um, other performers and such a well received, very, very positive concert experience. Choir members were asked to fill out surveys before and after the project, as well as rating forms before and after each rehearsal. So the first results are very positive. 
people's sense of well-being, enjoyment and connectedness increased not only after each rehearsal, but also over a longer time. For the whole choir, so for the choir members that we asked at the start and the finish of the project, uh, attitudes um, and stigma changed, stereotypes changed. Uh, for example, one of the stereotypes was uh, that uh, people with mental illness are dangerous or unpredictable or incapable. Um, and yeah, that's definitely changed over time, so that is great. Uh, another result we found that was very positive in uh, changing the mental health stigma was that um, uh, compared to the start of the project, people felt that uh, people with mental illness had um, yeah, they had more faith in uh, their capabilities, in uh, yeah, reaching their goals, uh, uh, having supportive friends, um, yeah, being able to, to uh, yeah, set goals and reach their goals in life. Um, yeah, there was just, they were more hopeful, and more positive uh, in general about the life of people with mental illness. Whoa!